Hello and welcome, dear listeners, to episode 57. Today, I'll be continuing my series on the Kingdom Planty by exploring the lineages of the ferns and the fern allies, which are two groups of vascular plants that both reproduce with spores. So far in this series, I've talked about green algae, which represents the ancestral branch of all land plants. And I've talked about the bryophytes, which were the first true green land plants that emerged from the slimy microbial mats and primordial muck of the green algae. But these bryophytes, the liverworts and the hornworts and the mosses, these are all very simple plants, lacking vascular tissue, and still highly dependent on water for their reproduction. Because they lack vasculature, the bryophytes require diffusion to move water and nutrients through their bodies. Diffusion is a relatively weak force that just can't move water very far, so the maximum size of the bryophyte's body is limited. It's limited by this physical variable. About 425 million years ago, during the Silurian period, the first lycophytes appeared. And these lycophytes were interesting for several reasons. First among them being the fact that these plants had a very primitive vascular tissue. They had an internal cellular physiology that created the first basic pipes, or tubing, that optimized water flow and sugar transport. These water pipe structures, which would become a fundamental aspect of pretty much all of the descendant vascular land plants, are called tracheids. The tracheids are these long columnar tubes that have tapering ends, so they kind of look like a toothpick, but they're orders of magnitude smaller. These little toothpick-shaped columns are also studded with little pits, or holes. So when you have billions of these little tracheids all aligned vertically and bunched up together, they create this hugely porous mass of cell wall tissue that's able to conduct water extremely well. Now, I talked about this physiology in much greater detail in episode 50, which was more specialized to plant hydration. But basically, there are a confluence of factors, like the various physical qualities of liquid water and the anatomy, uh, the physiological form of the tracheids, that allow them to efficiently move water vertically against the force of gravity. And ultimately, that's really the most impressive part about this, is that you have these, these living organisms that are able to passively resist the force of gravity in perpetuity, so long as they have access to water and sunlight and maintain turgor pressure. Now that's for water, but for sugar transport, they also evolved sieve tube elements, which are columns of large cells, almost entirely devoid of organelles, with their connecting cell walls perforated by holes. And these holes act kind of like sieves. They allow sugar water to flow through. Equipped with these primitive tracheids and sieve tubes, the early lycophytes found that they could transport water much farther up off the ground than their evolutionary ancestors, which opened the door for them to grow larger than any plant before them ever had. But let's not get carried away. The early vasculature structures of these early lycophytes were, as I said, primitive. They were simple, unrefined, and while they could move water much better than moss, their vasculature was still relatively weak and low complexity. For example, a defining feature of the lycophytes are their microfills, which are thin, tiny leaves possessing a single vein running down their center, with diffusion moving water and nutrients out from that central vein into the surrounding tissue. In other words, their vascular system was still so primitive that they hadn't developed capillaries yet. However, evolution doesn't stop. This simplicity was not bound to last forever. Over millions of years since their first emergence, the lycophytes evolved and adapted greater complexity, such that the world became covered in these sprawling forests of massive lycophyte trees. The order Lepidodendrales and Sigillaria thrived during the early Carboniferous period, growing up to 30 meters tall and a meter and a half wide, 
and spreading out to cover more ground and expand their range, and doing so for many millions of years. This spread and growth lasted for more than a hundred million years, spreading massive tropical lycophyte forests across the European and Asian continents. But about 300 million years ago, well into this highly successful planetary colonization project, the climate began to change. The world got cooler and colder, and this led to the Carboniferous rainforest collapse, which saw the widespread fragmentation and reduction in size of the world's lycophyte forests. The golden age of these massive lycophyte trees came to an end, and they began to die off. The large lycophytes experienced a resurgence during the early Triassic period, and they were able to opportunistically spread after the devastation of the asteroid impact that killed off the dinosaurs. Species of club mosses are the closest living relatives of these ancient lycophyte trees, and they simply don't hold a candle to the size and the ecological importance of their now extinct cousins. In the modern day, the extant lycophyte species are all relatively short and small compared to more recently emerged lineages of trees and tall bushes and other plants like that. These lycophytes can be separated from algae and bryophytes because of their vascular tissue, which helps them transport water further against gravity, and thus enabling them to grow taller. They can also be separated from bryophytes due to the fact that their sporophyte generation is dominant, not their gametophyte generation. Now, on the other hand, the lycophytes can also be separated from the more complex vascular plants, like gymnosperms and angiosperms, because their vascular tissue is relatively simple and undeveloped. Where the gymnosperms and angiosperms have sophisticated cellular systems for transporting water, sometimes dozens of meters against gravity, the lycophytes have a simple structure called a protostella, which is a single column of xylem with a layer of phloem wrapped around it, which runs through the center of the plant's tissue, like a stem or a leaf. There are several types of protostella that exist in the various lineages of lycophyte, with different structures and functional advantages. The simplest protostella is called a haplostella. It's composed of a simple cylindrical column of xylem wrapped in a simple tube of phloem. It's just what I described a moment ago. But it also typically has a layer of endodermis, which would be a third layer inside the xylem. The actinostella, common in club mosses, is similar to the haplostella, except that instead of the vasculature tissue being a simple cylindrical column, it has lobes, bends, grooves, and folds. This diverse structure is a lot more dynamic and asymmetrical than the haplostella. The phloem layer in the actinostella is generally thinner, and the xylem is much more irregular but uh, these seemingly uh, odd qualities are displaced by the fact that it has a, a greater surface area and can thus more easily distribute water to more tissue. The third type is the plectostella, which is kind of weird. I mean, it's weirder than the first two. The xylem in the plectostella generally grows in a column shape, like the simple haplostella, but the phloem isn't just simply wrapped around it. The phloem penetrates the xylem and cuts through it, digging through it, forming parallel plates or sheets of phloem that transverse the xylem column. Earlier, I mentioned club mosses. These are perhaps some of the more common kinds of lycophytes. These plants often have lobe-shaped leaves, or leaves that don't appear to protrude like the typical leaves you'd see on an oak tree or something. Consider the club moss Diphasiastrum digitatum also known as the fan club moss. These plants have flat, plastic-looking leaves that extend outward with a dichotomous branching pattern. At every node of branching, the main stem divides into two smaller branches. The main stem splits once, twice, five times, ten times, producing a lot of increasingly small branches that radiate outwards like green fingers. It's because of their fan-like appearance that they're called fan club moss, and because of their dichotomous branching that produces Y-shaped joints between the branches and Y-shaped branch tips, 
They're also called crow's foot. Another species to consider is the Lycopodium clavatum, also known as the ground pine, which literally looks like a tiny little pine tree growing on the forest floor. They have a main stem with little overlapping leaves that look like pine needles, and with their simple branching structure, they really do look like the branch of a pine tree. Some of their branches have sporophyll leaves protecting the sporangia, and when it's time to reproduce, these branches get held straight up. The sporophyll leaves will dry out and get degraded by the wind and from physical disturbances like an animal walking by, and the spores will be released. These tiny ground pine lycophytes have a close relative called the Lycopodium obscurum, which is a less widespread cousin species that grows four to five times as tall as the Lycopodium clavatum, with a much more complex branching pattern, but the similarly short, thin leaves that really capture the pine sapling look. A lot of other club moss have this general appearance, with simple branching structures, a mature form that's only a few centimeters tall, and a body plan composed of a single stem with little to sometimes even no branching, and all of it covered in small, thin leaves that look to the naked human eye like fuzzy green hairs. Some of these species include the simple Lycopodyla inundata, the thicker and fuzzier Hapersia salago, or the northern fir moss, and the equally fuzzy but moderately taller Hapersia lucidula, or the shining fir moss. So there are these club mosses and the very closely related fir mosses, and if we move out a little bit from this evolutionary cubbyhole we found ourselves in, the first thing we'll run into is the Salaganella genus of spike mosses, and then the Isoides genus of quill warts. Earlier, I mentioned the Lepidodendrons, the ancient lycophyte trees that were the dominant tree lifeform on the planet between 300 and 400 million years ago. It's believed that, in a way much like the birds are to the dinosaurs, the closest living relatives of these ancient plants are the quillworts. This is generally believed to be the case because of Isoides bistonii samples taken from Permian era rocks, representing some of the first known quillworts. These samples demonstrate several interesting traits shared with the giant lycophyte trees, including the growth of modified shoots that were used as roots, and the growth of wood tissue and bark as an outer protective layer. Alright, so all of these lycophyte groups that I've just mentioned and discussed are part of a larger group called the fern allies. These so-called fern allies are fern-like plants. They have a similar morphological pattern to their leaf expression to true ferns, and they also have a dominant sporophyte generation that reproduces with spores. The other fern allies include the Silotopsida, or the whisk ferns and moonworts, and the Equisitopsida, or the horsetails and scouring rushes. The Silotopsida whisk ferns are small shrubby plants with rhizoids instead of roots and no leaves. Curiously, instead of leaves, they have these weird discolored bulbous protrusions called enations. The moonworts of the genus Botrychium are a little more complex, as they can grow somewhat thick leaves and true roots, but they also depend on a symbiotic relationship with fungi to obtain all the nutrients that they need. Another Silotopsida group is the Ophioglossacea family, or the adder's tongue plants. These are really strange-looking plants, with a single, large leaf, and a long sporangia structure that looks kind of like the tip of a rattlesnake's tail, but slender and green, and on the end of a plant instead of on the end of a snake. Then there are the Meritiidae ferns, which are relatively huge. They grow thick stems and thick branches, with big leaves. In fact, some of these leaves are so broad that they're some of the biggest leaf fronds of any fern ally or any fern. The last group in the fern allies is the Equisotopsida, or the horsetails and related species. The horsetails are really interesting plants, because they show quite a bit more structural complexity than the first mosses I described. These have stems that grow in squat, cylindrical segments, and, beginning a few centimeters off the ground, the junctions between each segment start to express a whorl of leaves. 
The leaves are thin tubes, like tentacles or spokes, each vascularized by a single vein. They get longer the higher they are off the ground, tapering again near the very top of the plant, which gives them their overall horsetail shape that they're named after. Each segment of their stem possesses an intercalary meristem, which means that growth can occur in each segment between the nodes, not just at an apical meristem at the tip of the plant or at the tip of the branches. Although every currently living species of horsetail is purely herbaceous and relatively small, there are extinct species of horsetails that could at one point grow wood through secondary growth, and ultimately become up to 10 plus meters tall. So the club mosses, spike mosses, and quillworts are all lycophytes. They're fern allies, but they're basically just simple, primitive cousins to the ferns. Then you have the whisk ferns, the horsetails, and the meritiidae, which are also part of the fern allies, in a group called the eusporangiate ferns. Where the lycophytes are kind of like cousins, these eusporangiate ferns are like siblings to the true ferns. These are grouped together because they share a similar development strategy for their spore-producing structures. In these eusporangiate ferns, they have an entire group of differentiated cells that will develop and grow into the sporangia. This differentiates them from the true ferns, called the leptosporangiate ferns, which produce their sporangia structures from a single epidermal cell instead of a whole group of cells. Basically, the clade fern refers to both the eusporangiate and the leptosporangiate ferns, but only the leptosporangiate are called the true ferns. Ferns are the vegetable frontiersmen, the photosynthetic pioneers of suboptimal habitats that seed plants and flowering plants might find too stressful to colonize. In these kinds of habitats, the ferns are able to outlast and outcompete these other kinds of plants, and so they tend to dominate. These areas include wetlands, like the marshes and swamps, the crevices, pits, and other dark areas in mountainous terrain, the dry desert, the humid shaded areas of tropical, temperate, and boreal forests, and in the trees themselves, in the form of a huge variety of epiphytes. The fern stem is composed of denser tissue than you would find in your typical herbaceous plant stem. Many ferns possess stems composed of semi-woody tissue, and this enables them to grow to extreme heights for a fern, or for a fern ally, in some cases 20 meters tall. Smaller ferns, like shorter ground-dwelling ferns and the epiphytes that grow on trees, have horizontally growing stems called stolons. These stolons will creep along the ground, or in the case of an epiphyte, they'll creep along a tree branch to establish new nodes. Each new node will grow roots of its own that penetrate into the soil and tap it for water and nutrients. Or in the case of epiphytes, instead of new roots, it'll grow new rhizoids to help anchor it to the tree substrate. In the case of the ground-based ferns, these roots work just like the roots of seed plants, but only in the sporophyte generation. Remember that ferns are sporophyte dominant, and this larger sporophyte generation will have legit root systems. But the gametophytes, the smaller non-dominant generation, only grow rhizoids. These rhizoids are much thinner, more fibrous, and much shorter than the actual root systems. The rhizoids only grow relatively shallowly into the soil, which provides them a mechanical anchoring. And in many cases, uh, like for epiphytes, the rhizoids aren't used to absorb nutrients, but instead, they just they work solely as an anchor to hold the fern onto the tree branch so it doesn't fall off. From these nodes where the root or the rhizoid systems form, or off of the stipe that branches off the stem, the fern will grow leaves. These emerge from the fern's body as a growing mass of leaf tissue that's tightly coiled up into a ball often called a fiddlehead because of its similar appearance to the end of the musical instrument. Through a fascinating unfurling mechanism called circinate vernation, this leaf ball will loosen up and roll out into a flat, mature leaf form. The leaves that grow off the stipe are called pinny, and these are complex leaves that have smaller lobes called pinules that are organized along the leaf edge like teeth in a saw. Most of the fern's leaves are trophophyll leaves, 
which are leaves that are purely for photosynthesis, for conducting sugars and enabling vegetative growth. The minority of a fern's leaves are sporophyll leaves, which are fertile leaves used for reproduction. In many species, they look exactly like the trophophyll leaves, and they can still conduct normal photosynthesis and sugar transport and all that good stuff. But in other fern species, these sporophyll leaves might be smaller or paler due to less pigment and less nutrients being uh, invested in the leaf architecture and more nutrients being directed towards the, the growth of the sporangia. On the underside of these sporophyll leaves, the sporangia will grow as these little masses called sori, which are arranged in rows or clusters. So the sporophyte generation grows these sporophyll leaves, which are fertile leaves that possess masses of granular sporangia along their undersides. These sporangia will produce and release haploid meospores, which can be pushed by the wind or blasted some distance away by an evolved release mechanism. For example, a protective coating on the sporangia called an inducium can dry up and shrivel until the internal pressure ruptures it and the spores are blasted some distance away, kind of like shrapnel from a grenade detonation. These spores will land somewhere else and hopefully germinate, and then grow into a new haploid individual of the gametophyte generation. The gametophyte generation of most ferns is small and stubby, looking a lot like a moss or like a liverwort. The photosynthetic body form is the prothallus, which is a kidney-shaped or some kind of globular structure with a width and a length typically less than 9 or 10 millimeters, so they're about the size of your thumb, give or take. This photosynthetic prothallus is typically composed of a single large cell, but the gametophyte form has other cells that do other things. Namely, they have gamete-producing structures that they use to reproduce. The antheridium is the male sex structure that produces flagellated sperm. To get the sperm into contact with an egg, the sperm gets released into water, a, a water matrix, either groundwater from flooding or from rainfall, or raindrops that splash onto the body of the fern itself and splash little sperm-filled particles a short distance away. However it happens, the sperm eventually makes it to the archegonia, which is the female sex structure. And like all of the other plants I've talked about so far, the archegonia is shaped like a flask or a vase. The sperm will flow in through the top. It'll go down through a tube to an open space at the bottom, where the egg is stored. This initiates fertilization, creating a sporophyte individual that grows into a large, mature fern. So earlier, I mentioned the eusporangiate and the leptosporangiate ferns and their evolution. I talked about the eusporangiate ferns, uh, they're the horsetails and the whisk ferns and the maritiidae that I talked about, but now I want to dive into the evolution of the true ferns, the leptosporangiate ferns. These organisms first emerged on the planet sometime in the Devonian period, some 360 million years ago, but many of these earliest species have gone extinct. Most of the currently existing fern species had their ancestors originate within the last 200 million years or so, during the so-called Great Fern Radiation in the late Cretaceous period. The first of these lineages to appear that would persist into the modern day was the Osmundacea family, which is presently quite small, with less than 25 known species, although the individuals in most of these 25 species tend to grow relatively large for a fern. After their divergence came the Hymenophyllales, or the filmy ferns, which emerged sometime in the late Triassic, around 200 to 250 million years ago. These Hymenophyllales have diversified into about 650 different species, the vast majority of which are confined to very humid and very wet habitats like the Pacific Northwest in North America, and the more humid Atlantic coastlines of Europe. These are habitats characterized by a lot of rain and fog, and in some places there are waterfalls, where water is being constantly thrown into the air, and as a result, the air is very humid, 
and these ferns are typically covered in a thin coat or film of water, which gives them their name. Because these typically grow in places where there's a lot of water and a high humidity, they aren't often exposed to drought conditions, so they haven't really evolved any major defenses against water stress. They don't even have stomata. They have a, a small cuticle, or no cuticle at all. Their fronds are often just a few cells thick, so dry air can easily suck the moisture right out of them. Although it should be said that not all of these hymenophyllales live, uh, live in humid, wet areas. Some of them do live in drier areas, and they've adapted to those habitats with thicker leaves, larger cuticles, etc. The next divergence in the leptosporangiate ferns are the glycineales, which are found mostly in tropical regions, like the island environments of Oceania in the Pacific Ocean. The glycineales are wildly diverse, with species that look like tiny ferns, big ferns, and even palm trees. Because these ferns are so diverse, they aren't really easily tacked down into a single clade with a nice, clean description. Instead of being a discrete clade with a group of shared traits, the glycineales are more like a basal gradient that connect the older fern lineages with the younger, more recently emerged fern lineages. On the younger end, this gradient will give way to the schizioles, which also includes a, a wide variety of species. Although the variety in the schizioles is less disordered, they actually have clusters of traits that, uh, that unify them and that can be used to define them and group them together. And so they've been organized into three distinct families. There's the schiziacea, the Anemiaceae, and the Ligodiaceae. The Schiziaceae are about 190 species of small and temperate ferns, with thin stems and small leaves. In a lot of species, the leaves look like little green combs at the top of the stem, which holds the reproductive organs. Now, the second family is the Anemiaceae, which are larger ferns with a more traditional fern appearance, that they, they grow their leaves in the symmetrical dimorphic pattern. However, there's a subgroup within them, an African genus called Mohria, which defies this dimorphic pattern. The third family is the Ligodiaceae, or the climbing ferns. These are really cool plants. They're tropical ferns that demonstrate indeterminate growth. Essentially, as long as they have access to sunlight, water, and nutrients, they can keep growing, more or less perpetually. They have structures in their stems called rachis, or rachis, which are long, flexible structures that act like grasping tentacles. These rachis will warp or curl around various objects in the environment, like a tree branch, or a small protruding part of an artificial structure, like a windowsill, a loose nail coming out of a wall, a rooftop, deck handrails, gutters, whatever. If these rachis can warp around it and get a secure foothold, it will anchor the frond to the surface and hold it steady. The Ligodiaceae fern can then continue growing, literally climbing up the sides of a building or up a tree. They grow, climbing up until they find a new anchoring point which can support more growth, and they can climb more along the surface. Branching fronds from these ferns can hang off the trees or buildings and dangle vines down to the ground. And some of these fern vines can grow up to 12 meters or up to 40 feet long. So after this basal grade of Glycineales and Schiziaceae, the next lineage to diverge was the Salviniales, or the water ferns. As the name suggests, these are marine-based ferns that live either rooted in the water-saturated soil of wetlands or near the coast, or they just live free-floating on the surface of the water. These Salviniales water ferns are also heterosporous, producing different types of spores, like a microspore that makes male gametophytes and a megaspore that makes female gametophytes. Curiously, this trait separates them from every other kind of fern. This was kind of surprising to me when I learned it, because I kind of assumed that for a whole group of increasingly complex plants, 
that all reproduce with spores, it seems a little counterintuitive that only one clade within them would be heterosporous. I would have figured that it would have been a much more common trait among the ferns, but I guess it's not. After the Salvinules diverged the Cyatheales, or the tree ferns. If the water ferns live in water, then it's not too hard to guess where the tree ferns live. Except it might be hard, because if you guess that tree ferns live in trees as epiphytes, you'd be wrong. They're called tree ferns because they're huge, and they grow thick, tree-like stems that can get anywhere from 1 to 2 to more than 30 feet tall. These tropical and subtropical ferns have really large fronds that unfurl through vernation like the rest of the ferns. Each frond can be several feet long, with many of the larger Cyatheales ferns looking a lot like palm trees, like the Cyathea medullaris in New Zealand that grows up to 20 meters tall and rakes the sky with these huge fronds that look like giant green rib cages. When the Cyatheales diverged, the lineage that they split from would become the Polypodiales. These are kind of neat, because in a way, they are to ferns what flowering plants are to seed plants. The flowering plants are seed plants, but they're the most recently emerged lineage of seed plants, and they account for the majority of the currently extant seed plant species. In much the same way, these Polypodiales are the most recently emerged fern lineage, showing up around 100 million years ago. And they're the most common, comprising something like 80% of modern fern species. I mean, just look at the number of families in the clade, uh, and compare them to other ferns. Like, in the Osmundales, you have one family. The Hymenophyllales have one family. The Salviniales have two families. The Glycineales have three families, and the Schizuales have, uh, have three families as well. And the Cyatheales have eight families, which is a lot compared to the rest that I've listed so far. But these Polypodiales, by comparison, have a whopping 26 families. Because they're so numerous and so widespread, they've diversified to adapt to a wide range of habitats generally with the exclusion of the more explicitly brutal habitats, like uh, tundra and taiga, hot deserts, and high up in the dry, cold, mountainous alpine habitats. Also because they're so numerous and so diversified, there aren't too many traits that are shared among all of the polypodiales. Now, you might have noticed this as I talked about other species in this episode, and the episodes on green algae and bryophytes, but when you have a wide and diverse group of species that don't share that many traits, the traits they do share often exist at a very basal level, like the structure or arrangement of the cells and the reproductive architecture. Or in other cases, it's something that's shared only in the early developmental processes. Anyway, both the eusporangiate and the leptosporangiate ferns exist within a massive clade called Polypodiopsida. The first ferns appeared some 360 million years ago, and some 40 million years later, from them diverged a lineage called the spermatophytes, or the seed plants. This is the next major lineage of plants that I'll be exploring in this series on the Kingdom Plantae. So if that sounds cool, be sure to subscribe so you can check that episode out right when I post it. If you like this episode, hit the like button, and if you're listening to this episode on iTunes, then go into the iTunes store and give the podcast a, a positive review. You know, leave a rating and, and maybe leave, leave a sentence or two describing uh, what you think of it. Anything you do to support the podcast really helps. And if you want to support the podcast in other ways, check out the online store. It's stuff that I've drawn myself. Or just tell your friends about the podcast and get them into it. And as always, thanks for listening. Oh.